The expression, I did my own research, sometimes carries a negative connotation related to conspiracy theories. But the truth is, doing one's own research can be literally life-saving, if done right. It can also be incredibly self-destructive, if done wrong. I've been doing scientific research professionally my entire adult life. Doing my own research is literally my job, but I also use it daily in my personal and family life. In this video, I'm going to give you all the tools and tricks of the trade to get started. And I'm also going to share some real-world examples of how I use these skills, including some life-and-death situations. You don't need any formal scientific training, only some time, some patience, and an open mind. We'll start with the tools, then we'll look at types of scientific studies and how to get the most out of them, and we'll wrap up with some key pitfalls to avoid. So it should be a pretty solid starter pack. Let's go. The problem with doing our own research is that, by definition, we have no expertise in that topic. So how can we tell accurate from misleading information if we're not familiar with the basics? What most people do is hop on Google and you immediately get hit with a thousand blogs and podcasts. That's like jumping into the deep end of the pool not knowing how to swim. We need some floaties or a rope, something to hold on to, some structure. Scientists use specialized databases to find information, like PubMed. It's just a search engine for research studies. I used it every single day for years, although lately I end up using Google Scholar a lot more. It has a few perks that we'll look at. Obviously, how intuitive it is, it's just like Google, but it's pre-selected for peer-reviewed research. So a lot of the work of separating wheat from chaff is already done for us. So let's say I want to research a health issue. Say I have psoriasis. I just enter it here, and you get thousands of hits. Each of those entries is a research paper. Now we could just add more search terms to make it more specific. Psoriasis nutrition which gives us a lot less hits, more specific. We can also use quotes for a specific expression, just like on Google. For example, reversal of psoriasis. Another cool feature is restricting the dates. So I can limit the search to articles that are four years old maximum. Just click here where it says since 2018, and now I have a lot less hits, only nine. Another cool little trick is the star icon. If we click that, it saves that study in our reading list. Click done and now just go here where it says my library and the studies we selected are all saved here. So we can basically go through all the hits and move the ones we like to our list to read later. And we can actually organize the list with different labels, which allows you to group studies into different sublists if you're researching different topics, for example. You could have a label for psoriasis treatment and one for psoriasis symptoms, and on and on. We can also do an advanced search. Click this menu icon on the top left on the Google Scholar page and click advanced search. You can specify several words that must all be present. You can specify an exact phrase. This is the same as, as the quotes that we looked at. Um, you can exclude words. You can search by author, etc. But probably the most important thing about Google Scholar are these links to the right of the title. These are the full text versions. If there's a free access full text online, it'll be listed here. And this is really convenient for obvious reasons. If you click the actual title, often you hit a paywall. But here, full text, magic. And a decent amount of studies have these links. For the ones that don't, when we hit the paywall, we can copy the URL and we can put that into this website called Sci-Hub and it often has a PDF we can access. Now there's some controversy over the legality of Sci-Hub and copyright. I'm actually not up to date on all of the details, so I hope it's not illegal to show you this. Who is it? FBI, open up! Uh-oh. Okay, before I show you another hidden gem that a lot of people don't know about, Another cool feature on Google Scholar is to show only review articles. So for example, narrative reviews are basically overviews of a topic. They're really handy for beginners to get a sense of the landscape of the field. Now, bear in mind, they're basically an essay with the perspective of the author. So 
take it with a grain of salt and look at a few before you form an opinion. Other than that, we have a few types of studies you're going to find. There's the so-called mechanistic research, which includes research on lab animals like mice, experiments in test tubes, and cell culture. And you can tell from the title or the abstract of the paper which type of study it is because you'll say something like uh, effect of this molecule or this pathway in rodents. Or the abstract will specify we used mice or this cell line, for example. Then we have observational research like epidemiology where we basically look for a correlation between people's normal habits and their health. And then we have clinical trials like randomized control trials where the volunteers are split randomly and assigned different drugs or foods or treatments. And again, you can tell from the titles or the abstracts if the study falls under one of these umbrellas because the observational studies will say something like cohort studies and we clinical trials will say we randomized the volunteers or we ran a randomized control trial. And finally, there are composite studies like meta-analyses that take several existing studies and pool them all and analyze them all together and systematic reviews that go over all the data in a field. Now, this is very important because isolated studies can sometimes be confusing. So you want to look for balance of evidence in a field. And one shortcut to that are meta-analyses and systematic reviews. So that's basically the hierarchy of scientific weight. Evidence isn't all created equal. For example, if research in mice shows that a drug is effective, but clinical trials in humans show no efficacy, it's basically a dud. Interestingly, a lot of internet confusion on COVID treatments, on nutrition, on different medications hinges exactly on this concept. Most people are not familiar with this hierarchy of evidence, understandably, so it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Anybody can Google a study, but the trick is to know how all of the data fits together. So now you know. And speaking of hierarchy, a hidden treasure for anybody doing their own research is the Cochrane Library. It's an international collaboration and they publish some of the best meta-analyses in the world. These actually show up on Google Scholar as well, but here they're all organized and concentrated so you go straight to the highest level stuff. So you would just enter a keyword in the search box and a world of top level information pops up. They have a lot of comparisons of different treatments for a given condition, for example, which is great. So let's say I know somebody who was diagnosed with liver cancer. I would enter it here and we have a bunch of information on different treatments, radioablation, Chinese herbs, surgical versus non-surgical. This is really cool. So they do all of these comparisons at the highest level of scientific rigor. Let me give you a real life example of how important this stuff can be. Six months ago, my mother was in the ICU tubes coming out of everywhere. She was in organ failure and she was basically skin draped over bone. And her doctors, coincidentally, the guy running the ICU was a friend of mine that I went to medical school with. The team of doctors told us there was nothing else they could do for her. Now she has a kidney transplant, which means she has to be on immunosuppressant medication, which obviously suppresses the immune system. That's the function, but it also leaves you vulnerable to infections. So she had had an infection that left an open wound in her body about that large leading straight into her abdominal cavity. So you have an entryway for infection in somebody with a suppressed immune system. It's a ticking time bomb. And so her team of doctors wrecked, they wrecked their brains. They're talked to, they consulted with uh, leading experts in other European countries. And they set us down and they said, look, we exhausted all the options. We talked about everything. We thought about everything. There's nothing we can do medically or surgically for technical reasons. We can't just sew it shut. So she's just going to keep reinfecting, going into this septic shock and organ failure. So basically it's a terminal situation. We're going to pump her full of antibiotics. If she survives this episode, take her home, spend as much time with her as you can. Basically say your goodbyes because the next one is going to be her last. So in this desperate situation of life and death, I didn't go to Facebook. I didn't go to podcasts. I went to the Cochrane. I read every meta-analysis I could find on wound healing, on chronic wounds, on techniques to dress wounds, and anything that emerged with consistent evidence, we applied. So we designed a strategy with a couple of key elements. First, we dressed her wound in sterile conditions every single day for months. We ordered medical material, 
sterile gloves, sterile tweezers, sterile kits. Her room looked like a warehouse with all the cardboard boxes piled up. And every single day we did the, the, the procedure in sterile conditions. In, in the beginning it felt like the scene in the movies where the guy's disarming a bomb. And I was like sweating bullets because if I make a mistake and I infect her, I could potentially kill her. Another thing that came out of those meta-analyses with some evidence on wound healing was hyperbaric chamber treatments. So we uh, set it up with a specialized center so she could do those and she did dozens and dozens over months. And the last one that came out of those meta-analyses was a special supplement, a combination of fatty acids with a specific amino acid. So we found a brand that offered that product. They didn't have it at the drugstores, so we ordered it and she took it every day for months. Very slowly, very gradually over time, the wound got smaller and smaller and not long ago it closed and she got stronger, she put the weight back on and she's unrecognizable. We just went to the hospital, the doctors couldn't believe how she looks. She looks like a different person from only six months ago and she got strength in her legs again to get up. For months she couldn't get up on her own and she's basically running around playing with her grandchildren. Now the point of the story is not that we found something specific that saved her. It's an anecdote. So by definition, it's very difficult to establish cause and effect. We'll never know which, if any, of those elements was key. It's possible, theoretically, that time alone would have done it. The point of the story is that in a desperate situation, this is the resource I trusted. This is the resource I relied on. So I'm giving you guys the best stuff that I know. Another interesting tidbit is that during that difficult time, friends and family knew about her situation. So everybody had an anecdote of a wound they had that initially wouldn't close and then they ate something or rubbed something on it and it closed. And I listened to every one of those stories and I fact checked them all using exactly the process I'm showing you guys. And most of them had no evidence behind them. And for those, I, we did not apply them. We did not uh, flip the coin with my mom. And that was for two reasons. The first one is that if there's no evidence of efficacy, there was also no evidence of safety. So trying something random could make it worse. And the second reason is that devoting attention and time and resources to something without evidence can divert our attention and our resources from something that has more evidence and has more promise. All right, so we searched the database for some information that matters to us and we found a list of hits. Now what? If you're not used to looking at scientific studies, they can look a bit daunting. But don't be overwhelmed. This is just like anything else. You get used to it and it gets easier. And please don't be intimidated by scientific jargon. Just look up any strange words you see and it'll all start making sense. You'll, you'll start to see the same words come up again and again. This happens to scientists too. If I start looking at papers in a different field that I've never looked into, there will be some terminology that I'm not familiar with and I'll just look it up and keep moving forward. Now, the structure of scientific studies is very standardized. We have the title, the list of authors, the abstract, which is just a summary of the findings, and this already gives you a lot of information. Then we have the introduction, where they go over the background of that field and how their research fits in. Then the methods, this is where they explain how the experiments were done, experimental details. Then the results, the actual meat of the paper, usually with figures or tables to illustrate the findings. And finally, the discussion, where they talk about implications of their findings and limitations and future work. Now, sometimes you have some final small sections, a conclusion, some acknowledgments, and then the list of references. This is all the research they cite in the study. When you're just getting started, the most important sections are the introduction, helps you get situated with the background information, the results, obviously they describe what they actually found, and the abstract, which summarizes everything. As you get more and more familiar, your focus might change. Nowadays, if I look at a study in one of my areas of core interest, I'll just skip the introduction and I'll focus mainly on methods and results. All right, let's talk about some mindsets and some psychological traps. Honestly, this is the most important part of the video. So here are the top five pitfalls when we're doing our own research. The most important thing when doing our own research is to strike a balance between self-confidence and humility. I see people making two big mistakes. 
They assume doctors know everything, or they assume doctors know nothing. And both are very self-defeating because they tie our hands. There's a ton that a patient can bring to the table. For example, understanding his or her condition can help the process a lot. And yes, researching and finding information can sometimes be a game changer, especially if your condition is a little less common, which can mean your doctor might have less experience with it. At the same time, we want to stay receptive to professional opinions. We don't want to get into this mindset that I read two blogs over the weekend, so now I'm an expert and all scientists are wrong. This is very self-destructive. When we're doing our own research, the search is not for something that no scientist has ever found. It's for something that has been found, but isn't general knowledge because it's very specific. That's a key difference. Like with my mother's example in her open wound, my goal was to find if there's anything in the literature with evidence behind it that could improve her chances. It wasn't to gamble with her life with some unproven stuff from Facebook. Doing our own research is about getting deeper into science, not sidestepping it. It's about more science, not less. The other thing about keeping an open mind is I didn't go into this process knowing which solution I wanted to find. I didn't care which one ended up working. I just wanted to know if anything had some evidence behind it. And that's pitfall number three, shopping for the advice we want to hear. I often see people doing their own research, not because they're out of options, but because the solution they keep getting from their doctors or the scientific community is inconvenient. It's great to be skeptical, to fact check, to investigate more, but realize that the truth will often be inconvenient, will often require hard work and change. We see this in nutrition all the time. Ideally, the approach should be to ask which food is healthier or if food can have an impact on health. But then there's this big temptation to take the diet I like and then go look for evidence that it is indeed the best. And then we see all these screen names, low fat Steve, low carb Johnny, the paleo blog, the high fat doctor, and a given diet becomes an identity. People stop saying, I eat low fat food and they start saying, I am low fat. I am a low fat guy. Shopping for the advice we want to hear leaves us vulnerable because there's always somebody who's happy to give us the answer we want in exchange for money or applause. My PhD advisor used to say, if the result of the experiment comes out strange, be suspicious. But if it comes out exactly as you expected, be more suspicious because confirmation bias can be very powerful. So the more convenient the advice, the more it resembles what you wanted to hear all along, the more skepticism I recommend. Pitfall number four is clinging to the first idea we find. Uncertainty is very uncomfortable. In a psychological experiment, people who knew they were about to receive an electric shock felt stressed. But if there was a 50% chance of shock, they felt more stress. The uncertainty was actually worse than knowing for sure the pain was coming. This dislike for uncertainty can sometimes compel us to form opinions too quickly and then start defending those premature opinions fiercely, even when faced with contrary evidence. In order to avoid being wrong, we end up staying wrong. On social media, it's very popular to hold extreme views with absolute certainty and never waver. But in science, we actually tweak our views in real time as the evidence pops up. And this can be actually a really pleasurable process once you get used to it. And last but not least, pitfall number five is isolation. Flying solo makes everything harder. Nowadays, it's pretty doable to contact a scientist in a given field and ask some questions. We can email them or we can hit them up on Twitter, for example. I do this all the time. A lot of these people are very approachable, very generous with their time, and you can get some insights that would otherwise take years to find on our own. And I know I'm ragging on Facebook a lot in this video, but the reality is that internet communities like Facebook groups can be very empowering especially if you have a condition that's not common, uh, both for mutual support and to share resources. One caveat of these communities is ideological insulation. They can sometimes generate a dynamic of us versus them. We see this a lot in nutrition. Our diet is perfect and everybody else is a moron. And then these beliefs sp specific to that group get reinforced and validated through repetition within that circle. So two red flags. One, seeing conspiracy theories used to explain why the entire world 
disagrees with us. Everybody's corrupt or everybody's blind, and it's only here in our Facebook group that we see the truth. That's not a realistic worldview. And the second red flag is resistance or even resentment if you challenge those core beliefs. A science-minded group that's just looking for truth and for solutions is not going to be defensive. They'll actually welcome scrutiny and new ideas. So that's it for today, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. We might do a part two if there's interest. And definitely share below if any of these techniques help you in any way. I'd be very happy to hear that. Take care. See you next time.